Luke, I know it's, uh, it's jungle out there, so uh, you did well. You always passed the first, you know, the first mark of the, uh, the I camp uh, you know, ladder of success. I wouldn't say it was a glorious pass, but it was enough to, at least only start us 15, 20 minutes late, so not too bad. I um, hope we're all live, ready to go, we? Excellent. Okay, so I'm much pleasure this morning. Uh, introducing the team from York, which was originally meant to be John Quinby et al, but he's got a more important engagement than we have. So now it's uh, Stephen Cowling et al, who was going to come anyway with John, but uh, has now taken over as the master. It's good to see. And his able assistant, who's either called David Eber or Edward David, I'm not quite sure. Good <laughs> <Sure>. David. <laughs> good David. Sorry. Good David. Good David. Good David. <laughs> so they're from York. Uh, I used to be at Hull before that. And if you didn't name George Gray, I mentioned yesterday, who unfortunately passed away uh, about a month ago, weeks ago. Um, one of the iconic figures of genetic chemistry and the uh, synthesizer of this very white goo that Stephen's going to have in his talk today, the fun variant thereof, one of the pioneers of uh, liquid crystal chemistry. And uh, so they were very much part of that group, and that's now spread out to York, uh, very nice location. Maybe you'd better be at. Well, uh, <laughs> so I will uh, hand over to Stephen. He will give us the small speeder extravaganza of this introduction to literature. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you for that, Tim. So, good morning, everyone. And uh, so, as Tim just said, I'm Stephen Cowan from the University of York. Can you probably hear it, okay? There is a microphone. Yeah. yeah. Can you hear me at the back? Yeah. And so, what we thought we'd do this morning is give you a very broad introduction to the topic of liquid crystals. So as you can see on the bench at the front here, there's lots of gadgets, lots of demonstration toys. So this session is really a touchy-feely type session where you're going to get to meet liquid crystals, you're going to get to see liquid crystals respond, and hopefully get an appreciation of how sensitive the nature of liquid crystals are and why they've made such an impact into areas of the industry such as displays, uh, sensors, even biological systems. So, let's go right back to some real basics. So, this is what everyone gets taught at school. Three standard states of matter, solids, liquids and gases. I don't need to go into that any further, you all recognise these. Once we get to the professional scientist level, they then expand our ideas of what we actually understand about solids, liquids and gases. So for example, if we consider crystal states, we recognise that there's 230 space groups in the crystal states, and various different glasses within there, we recognise that there's one type of liquid and the different liquids might actually be immiscible. And there's one type of gas and all gas is immiscible. But you're entering the world of liquid crystals. And in terms of liquid crystals, we have even more information to understand and appreciate. And so, yes, we recognise that still these 230 space groups of, of crystals and all the different glasses. But we now have this foggy world of liquid crystals. Well, there's in the region of around 50 different liquid crystalline organisations. And I'm going to introduce you to a number of those today. Within liquid crystals, what we also recognise is that there are, in fact, different types of liquid states as well, so you can get different types of organisations within the liquid. And we still have this one type of gas, and what all gas is admissible. And so, I'm going to concentrate on this nice little area of liquid crystals in the middle here. Now, I'm a synthetic chemist. and my world, I consider molecules, and the different types of organisations of those molecules, in terms of giving us the, the liquid crystalline states. And so, this just gives you a very broad overview of all the different types of organisations and, and regions of liquid crystals that we have. So, for example, this is the main broad class that you get associated with displays, calamitic liquid crystals. Mainly pneumatics, so pneumatic devices, 
We all use pneumatic displays in our computers, in our televisions, watches. When you get so like organisations, semantics, or we might call them lamella phases, different shaped molecules. So, for example, adamantane, you get plastic crystals. So these are basically crystalline states where the molecules of adamantane can just spin and rotate on their sides. The molecules, instead of being rod shaped in the, in the calamitic, yeah. might be disc shaped. And if they're disc shaped, then we can get these discotic organisations, so pneumatic discotics. So if you like, if you consider this, this is just like having a whole host of pennies that are all just thrown around on top of each other quite randomly. <coughs> or they can organise in columns, and the columns can organise into uh, states. And then we get these uh, columnar discotic phases. Now these show different organisations as a function of temperature. So you change the temperature and you get different degrees of order within the molecule. But alternatively, there's another class which are lyotropic liquid crystals. So these are ones where these are surfactant-like molecules. Some of them, one half is water-liking, the other half is oil-liking. The hydrophobic, hydrophilic. And they organise in different ways associated with their concentration in water. And this is based on a curvature of the system. So if you've got zero curvature, you can have lamella like organisations. So just like so. Or alternatively, if you increase the curvature of the system, you can get these more organised hexagonal phases. And so this type of first system is used in a lot of detergents. They're also most relevant to biological systems. And so over here, this is a typical sort of cell membrane where we've got this lamella bilayer type system, and you can see the close relationship of this structure to the lamella structure over here. But on top of that, there's much more variety in terms of the, the types of structures, the complexity of structures that we can get. So these are just low molecular weight systems, small molecules. But we can have polymers, we can have network polymers, we can have branch systems, so these so-called dendrima systems. And all of these have their own different types of properties and they organise into liquid crystalline states in very similar ways to the low molecular weight systems. And then you can't leave this entire system without looking at uh, DNA. So DNA in itself, you write it into water, and it is also a liquid crystalline system. And so <clears throat> that covers all the structures around the outside of the diagram. But then inside, this gives you a whole range of different applications of the uh, technology of the systems. So for example, just said, the calorific liquid crystals go into displays, they go into switches, sensors, light modulators. <coughs> this like systems, they go into retardation films and the optical films that go on top of television screens to improve the optics. They're also used, believe it or not, as lubricants in the old um, hard drives of your computers. You've got the lyotropic systems, surfactants, <coughs> soaps, detergents. They're also used for templating in catalysis. Polymer systems for artificial muscle, for, for um, you need to use these for artificial bone, for, uh, for replacement for titanium, for example. Polymers can be used in sensors, so ferroelectric polymers, pyroelectric sensors. And if we go over onto this side of the membrane, then we get into the areas of drug delivery, of optical networks, gene therapy. So liquid crystals covers a broad scope of applications due to the diverse nature of the structures within the liquid crystal. And so let's just consider a rod-like system. And we'll just look at the melting process. So if we consider our molecules organised in a crystalline state, our molecules are organised in this highly regimental three-dimensional lattice. The molecules have their position on the lattice. You've got uh, periodic structure along the layers, 
you've got translational order between the layers. The molecules are sitting there on their thalatus sites. You apply heat, so energy into the system. You increase the energy of the molecules, and the molecules start moving around. Interactions between the molecules start to break down. At such a point where the molecules have just enough energy, then what happens is the molecules start to rotate, they start to vibrate. And eventually you get a breakdown in order where we consider going from crystal to a pneumatic state. The molecules lose their lattice positions, they're now free to flow around, just as they would in a liquid. But there's enough interactions between the molecules, so if you like the side-on interactions, so that the molecules are all roughly still pointing in the same direction. So we're getting this sort of um, cooperative flow of the molecules. They're all still roughly pointing in the same direction. You give those molecules even more energy, so if you like, this is like you going out to a disco in the evening. You start off in the beginning of the evening, you're quite happy, you're, you're moving around, but by the time you've had a few drinks, you've got a bit warmer, you start jumping around a bit more. Well, the molecules do just the same thing. So you put more energy into that system, <coughs> those molecules move around more, the interaction between the molecules break down. And so now, instead of having this organisation that are all roughly pointing in the same direction, they're now free to orient and rotate and tumble in all directions. And so we go from being liquid crystalline into a liquid. So if you want a definition of a thermotropic liquid crystal, you could say that this is a fourth state of matter. And it exists between that highly organised solid state and the disorganised liquid state. It has the flow properties of a liquid, but at the same time it has organisational properties of the solid. And that's what makes these materials so interesting. So I'm going to start off just by showing you how fluid a pneumatic liquid crystal is. So in this bottle, I've got a pneumatic liquid crystal. You can see if I, if I move it around, it flows just like a liquid. Have any of you actually encountered a liquid crystal before? If anyone has, just put your hand up. Okay, so a fair proportion of you. So, you can see that flowing around. So I'm going to do the experiment where we're going to look at the process labelled T3 on the board. So I'm going to put energy into this bottle, and I'm going to heat the liquid crystal up so it goes from being pneumatic to being liquid. So, I'll walk around so you can all see this as, as it goes. So as we heat it up, what you should be able to see is a transition from this opaque state to a completely transparent state. So what I will say is that inside here, this is just a single organic compound. It's not suspension, it's not an emulsion, we're not trying to re-dissolve something in the solution. Using the thermal energy for inducing a change in the state of matter from liquid crystal to isotropic liquid. Okay, so those of you at the front should be able to see this start to change now. Okay, so I'm going to wander around and just come to the ends of each of the benches and you can see. So you can see at the bottom here we're still in the dramatic phase. At the top here, this is now completely transparent. This is where it's disorganised. It's in the isotropic liquid. And so, those of you that can see, there's a very sharp boundary between the two. And that boundary is the clearing point of the liquid crystal. So this is the temperature at which we go from being liquid crystalline, so being pneumatic liquid crystal, to being isotropic liquid. 
So this is just a well-defined temperature. What compound is it, actually? Okay, so this particular compound, I'll just come into that, is the famous liquid crystal compound. This is what we call 5CB, or pentyl cyanobiphenyl. And this is compound is here. So this was the compound that was um, discovered by George Gray and his co-workers at Hull back in 1972-1973. And this was the material that really commercialised liquid crystals for displays. It was a room temperature pneumatic liquid crystal, and it was photochemically stable, and it was electrochemically stable. And so this was the first material that enabled us to have stable materials going into <coughs> devices. So this went into the early watches and calculators. It melts at around 24 degrees, is pneumatic through to 35 degrees. So in this bottle, we've got a very good temperature gauge. So this line between our pneumatic and our isotropic liquid, I know that anything above that is above 35 degrees. At that line is exactly 35 degrees, and below it is below that temperature. Now the other thing that's interesting to know, if you consider heating and recrystallizing normal uh, crystalline materials, you heat them up and you have a melting point. So you're going from this crystalline state to the liquid state at one temperature. But when you cool back down to the crystal, generally you get a large degree of supercooling. So it needs to cool down considerably to have uh, enough uh, organisation of the material to start to crystallise again back into that crystalline lattice. The temperature at which we go from being liquid crystallised to being liquid, that happens at the same temperature on heating and on cooling. This is a thermodynamic <coughs> process. So these states are thermodynamically stable. Now, I think the original title of this talk was Liquid Crystal Phases. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce you to some of the Liquid Crystal Phases, but then we'll concentrate on having a look at how responsive some of these Liquid Crystals are. And so generally, as we say, most of these Liquid Crystals we consider to be calamitic, rod-like, or lath-like uh, molecules. And so, Here's typical examples. We've got the alkyl cyanobiphenyls, we've got the alkyl cyanoterphenyls, and we've got the, uh, uh, the uh, PCH materials, these, these are the uh, uh, phenyl cyclohexanes. And all of these materials are organised to show this pneumatic like organisation. So, as I say, molecules are all roughly pointing in the same direction. And it's that organisation property where the molecules are all roughly pointing in the same direction that gives us this milky appearance of the, uh, the liquid crystal. So essentially what happens is, if you consider these molecules, you have different properties along the long axis of the molecule as opposed to across the short axis of the molecule. <coughs> the other materials, as I said, dislike. So these are the dispotic liquid crystals, or you might also find them called columnar liquid crystals. So this is a series of uh, triphenylenes called uh, the HACT series, hexaralkoxy triphenylenes. They organise into columns, so the molecules stack them by, by stacking. And those columns then organise into hexagonal organisations, so they become hexagonally close packed. And these are the typical types of textures that we see on the microscope for those materials. So we're viewing these between cross-polarizers. And the defects that are existing in those systems are allowing us to see all these beautiful textures and these characteristic fingerprint textures that allow us to identify what phases we're really seeing. So different organizations, we see different, different types of textures. So here we go, pneumatic. 
you look in the literature, nematos means thread-like. And the threads are these lines that are running through the nematic phase. These disc-like systems, discotics, well, that, that's just describing really the, the shape of the molecules that are giving these phases. But this is a typical texture of a hexagonal columnar phase. So you can see it's got far more sharp lines in there and, uh, and looks much more like a crystal than the first example of the matic. Alternatively, the molecules can organise into soap like structures. So this is what we call the spectic A phase. So the molecules are very weakly organised into layers. There's no or very, very short range order within the layers, there's no translational order between the layers. And when we view these on a microscope, we can view these black regions are where we're looking down the long axis of the molecules. And these pretty uh, fan-like regions, this is where we're viewing down the side of those molecules. So the molecules are laying down on the microscope sides in lots of different orientations. We can take these and we can cool them down. We can induce tilt into the system. So in the spectric A phase, the molecules are standing up within the layers, so the, the long axis is perpendicular to the layer plane. Whereas in the C phase, the molecules are tilted over within those layers. And you can see the difference here is these fans look nice and clean, nice and smooth, shiny, very few defects in there. But when we look at the spectric C phase, we get all these really sort of grainy patches in there. And that comes from different orientations of the tilt on the slide. And this region where we were looking down the long axis of the molecule, all of a sudden now we've got some texture in there. And this is associated with looking at the surrounding orientation of the tilt of the molecules in those regions. We can also have a degree of chirality in the system. So this is introducing handed uh, behaviour of the, the molecules to form helical-like arrangements within those phases. And this is just giving you an example of within the series of semantic phases, we can have a semantic A phase, which looks not really this, uh, to, uh, you know, virtually identical to the semantic A phase I showed you on the previous slide. But then as soon as we introduce tilt into the system, we also get these little lines in there. And these lines are an expression of the, the pitch of the helix of this material. So basically what's happening is, from molecule to molecule, we're getting a transfer of uh, chiral information. So they're interacting with each other through a small angular interaction. And so as we stack that up, basically what's happening is the tilt is progressing round to form a helix as we go through the bulk sample. And that's what we're seeing here in terms of these lines, is an expression of that pitch. And we can get lots of different organisations, so spectic C star, this is just where the tilt is all in the same direction, from layer to layer to layer. The next one is uh, spectic C gamma, or, or also known as the very electric phase. This is where we can have different numbers of, ori of orientations of the molecules within the layers. So if we go from one phase where the molecules are mainly tilted in this direction, we might have two that are tilted in the opposite direction before we go back to one in this direction, or it might be one, three, so on. The one labelled cosmetic CA, this is what we call an antiferroelectric structure. So basically as we go from layer to layer, we've got opposing tilt. So one layer the molecules are tilted in this direction, the next layer of molecules are tilted in the opposing direction. And then we can get even higher order phases below that. So these are short range hexagonal ordering within the layers. Now, that just gives you a very brief uh, sort of overview. There's, there's a whole diversity of structures within liquid crystals. So, what I'm going to concentrate on now is showing you how responsive the crystals are to external stimuli. So, we've already seen, just by me heating this bottle here, that liquid crystals respond to temperature. 
so we can change the states uh, just by heating them up. But what I'm also going to show you is that liquid crystals are responsive to electric fields. If they weren't responsive to electric fields, we wouldn't be able to create the vast display industry that we have now. <coughs> They're also responsive to magnetic fields. And so, do you want to... So, the first example, this is just to show you how fluid the liquid crystal is within a device. So what we've got here is we've got a, a large area device that's got a sandwich of the liquid crystal between two glass plates. <coughs> the organisation of the liquid crystal is such that uh, inside this device, you want to just get a prop. The liquid crystal is just sandwiched there between that plate of glass. And so just by mechanical stress, we can change the orientation of the liquid crystal within that device. So this is just mimicking the effect that we'd have by applying an electric field. So if you take a device, you apply an electric field, just taking the most basic concept of the device, you can have your pneumatic phase where the molecules are all laying down uh, parallel to the plane of the glass, you apply an electric field, and you can create an instability in there where you can get the molecules to, uh, to change their orientation from laying down to standing up. And just by doing mechanical stress, we can do exactly the same sort of thing. All we're doing is we're making the liquid crystal inside there flow. And as we're changing the flow, we're changing the optical properties of the liquid crystal within that device, and so we're seeing all of these different uh, colours between the, uh, between the polarisers. We need the polarizers there. This is, this is just really to visualize. If you have no polarizers, you can't see anything. So, in all these devices, you have to have some sort of polarizer around the device. We've seen electrical, we've, oh, sorry, we've seen thermal, we've seen mechanical. Now this time, we're looking at the interaction of the liquid crystal with a magnetic field. So all we've got here is the liquid crystal is aligned so it's standing up. We're, we're holding the magnet over the slide and the magnetic field from the magnet the liquid crystal couples to that electric field and it starts to lay down and deviate its orientation through coupling of the magnetic susceptibility of the molecule to the electric field. So you can see all these different ring patterns forming around here. Can you just leave it hanging there for a while and see if you can get Yeah. So you can see lots of different ring structures there, and that's from the magnetic field that's flowing around that magnet. Can turn that one off if you can do the microscope slide? Okay, so what we've got here is this is a real example of a liquid crystal on a microscope. So this is one of the tools that we use to visualise the types of uh, liquid crystalline states that we've got. So this, to describe the setup here, we're viewing the, the liquid crystal in a transmission mode. And we're viewing the liquid crystal between the cross polarisers. So if we're in the isotropic state, the light is just passing through, there's, there's little interaction, and the polarisers extinguish the light. So if we're in the isotropic state, this should be black. Because we've got the liquid crystal in there, the liquid crystal is interacting with the light. It, um, the way that it interacts with the light around defects allows us to see all these thread-like textures or fan-like textures. And when we're viewing this, we can tell a lot about the orientation of the liquid crystal. So in the pneumatic phase, if the liquid crystal is oriented, so the molecules are standing up 
on their ends, so the long axis is perpendicular to the plane of the glass, this would be black. The fact that we're seeing all this beautiful colour, the colour comes from changes in the thickness of the sample. And these dark threads, these basically represent changes in orientation of the liquid crystal. So where it's black, the liquid crystals are laying down, they're laying down parallel to the direction that one of the polarizers. And what we can do is we can also show that this is susceptible to airflow. So to shear stress. Okay, shear the sample. Okay. So this is the liquid crystal flowing around as a function of the air flowing across the sample. So what we tell school kids is that we tell them that this is a liquid crystal wave into them. And believe it or not, they also wave back. So if any of you feel like waving to the liquid crystal, I'm not going to stop you. And what we can also do is we can show them that this is also as a function of temperature. I can just heat the sample up. And that's how quickly it responds to temperature. Right. So what we're going to do now is we're also going to show you how low energy it takes to actually get the crystal to respond. So in my hand, I've got lots of little devices, and we're just going to come around, and I'm just going to ask some of you to hold on to the edge of some of these devices. So you see, I've covered a short video today, so there's no wires on my arms. So maybe it's too close, but let's try now. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Okay. 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 Okay, so what you've all noticed is, as I was wandering around there, I was never standing still, I was always shuffling my feet. It's not because I'm lazy, it's because I'm trying to generate some static electricity there, and what we're doing is we're driving that device by creating a circuit between us through static electricity. And so just a small amount of static is enough to power one of these devices. So this shows you why, you know, little devices like the watch display. Clocks. Calculators. All of these run off a small 6 volt battery. And so, one thing that you'll notice is that in a lot of devices, liquid crystals allow us to have portability. They allow us to have low energy. <coughs> and that can 
comes from the fact that the liquid crystal uses low energy to, to operate. When it comes around to you needing to change a battery in, in a lot of these devices, it's not because the liquid crystal itself has drained the battery. It's because it's the light source behind the liquid crystal that's drained the battery, or the circuitry around it that's draining the battery. And so what we can do is we can have a look at the vast array of devices that operate with liquid crystals. So, you know, this is a very first one of the very first liquid crystalline calculators. So the sharp one in the corner. We've got lots of little portable displays. So these go in boilers, they go in calculators, watches, you name it, they go into it. We have television screens. Now the very early television screens basically operated with the liquid crystal organized so that in one, on one surface the liquid crystal was oriented in one, in one direction, so say in drops forwards and backwards as we are now, and on the opposite surface it was rubbed at 90 degrees to it. So basically what happened is it created a 90 degree twist through that device. And so in its off state, when you viewed it between you know, cross polarizers, the light came into the device, got guided around a 90 degree twist, and exited the device because it could pass through the second polarizer. When you applied an electric field to that, instead of having this 90 degree twist that was guiding the light, the molecules inside there reoriented the electric field so they were now standing uh, roughly on their ends and the light was entering the device but it was no longer being guided so it's being extinguished by the second polarizer. And so when you're viewing the black digit on your, uh, on your display, so for example on the calculator here, that area where it's black is where the molecules are now standing on their ends. In all these other regions, it's where you've got this twist in the structure. Now, as with any type of application, there's, there's lots of different types of uh, generations of display. So, the very first types of uh, crystal uh, displays basically were um, an instability in the liquid crystal where you, you have this dynamic scattering mode, you apply the electric field, and you change the orientation from laying down to standing up. And this was quite a fluctuating type display, it was called the dynamic scattering mode. Then you had things like the twisted pneumatic mode, which, uh, as I say, goes into a lot of watches and calculators. This then went on where they decided that they could then create more twists in the structure, and you've got a super twisted pneumatic mode. And this was uh, certainly uh, this was invented by uh, Peter Rains, someone who uh, I work very closely with. And this went into a lot of mobile phone applications. So you know, this allowed us to go from the bricks that you used to carry around. You know, you used to see the London yuppie with the great big brick, uh, the great big antenna on top. And now we've all got these nice small smartphones. So electronics get smarter, but the displays inside them get better as well. You know, something which is very close to your heart, Tim, light modulation. So uh, different types of liquid crystals, so particularly symmetric liquid crystals, go into these spatial light modulators. And cameras, you know, we've all got digital cameras. In the back of that camera is a pneumatic display. But what you can also have and what I've got an example of is this. This was a very early example of one where we've got a small ferroelectric display. So this is based on a smectic structure and is much faster than the pneumatic displays. But the device inside here is no bigger than the size of your small finger now. And if you look on the, the back of most of your cameras and you pan around, you get a bit of time delay, so you get a bit of drag on the, on the reorientation as, you, as you're panning around. That's because the speed of the pneumatic is not fast enough to do real-time video. Whereas the ferroelectric is fast enough, and so the devices that go into these high-end cameras, say this is a very early uh, prototype model, allow you to have real-time viewing, where you're actually viewing through the liquid crystal display, or you're viewing the liquid crystal display um, inside the camera. But as I say, Liquid crystal technology has come on <coughs> and bounce. And so, you know, here's an example. 
108 inch television. So huge cinema screen size televisions. And not only does the liquid crystal inside there have to conform, and so as a chemist, we have to design materials that have very specific properties of materials to go inside these tallies so we get the performance. So, for example, we might need to get a certain temperature range of the pneumatic phase. The pneumatic is essentially an elastic fluid. So, you apply distortion to it, it responds, but then it will relax back. And so, we have to balance those elastic properties. We have to get those properties right so that it responds to give us the performance we need. The materials that go into there, they have to be photochemically stable. You cannot afford for light to be shone on your, your display and for the material inside to break down because when it breaks down, it creates impurities. The impurities may be ionic, which then disrupt the electrodes in the device. You lose your pneumatic phase and all of a sudden your device stops working. So, you know, tailoring properties of the materials that go into these is essential. And as we're talking about displays, you know, this shows you some of the more recent type applications. Multi-view screen. So if you view a screen from one side, you can be watching a film. But the person on the other side, for example, can be watching satellite navigation in the car. So dual view screens where you can get twice as much information from one screen. The only downside to this is essentially is that you have to have a filter in front of the screen that allows information from your even pixels to go in one direction and from the odd pixels to go in the opposite direction. And so, you only have half the resolution of your screen to display that sort of information. But in a similar way, what we can also do is we can do 3D projection. So, 3D TV without the need for glasses. And this is an area which uh, now these are the little displays that go into these high-end cameras, so they've got crystal and silicon technology. So light doesn't always have to be transmitted through the liquid crystal, we can actually reflect light through a display. And so that's what these uh, liquid crystal and silicon devices do. And then, the one at the bottom here, this, this is quite a nice one, this is a liquid crystal with tiny droplets encased in a polymer matrix. These are called polymer dispersed liquid crystals or smart windows. So what I'd like is I'd like a volunteer to come down to the front. Or a volunteer from the front. Right. Come, come, come round the back. You are, I'm not going to mind the students. Okay. <laughs> yep, okay. Come. All I want is somebody to stand behind that uh, opaque window. Be as spontaneous as you like. <laughs> so there's a reason I don't this. So you need to crouch down. Okay. So just so so you can be looking directly at this panel. Okay. Okay. So as I say, be as spontaneous as you like. Pull the face, I don't care. And so in its current state, the liquid crystal in there is oriented in all different directions. And as a result, what it's doing is it's scattering the light. So, all you see is a foggy window. But then, when he's pulling a face, we, we can open that window. And now he, now he can wake you all and see you. Can you move a little bit, please? <laughs> but then eventually, he's going to get bored of you all, and he's going to say, no, I want to go back to my window, and you can turn to the display. <laughs> So what we've done there is we've used an electric field to orient the liquid crystal. So as soon as we apply the electric field, all the liquid crystals in the, that droplet orient so they're now in uh, the long axis is, is perpendicular to the plane of this glass. So you're allowing light to be transmitted through or, or to be able to view through the device. And then as soon as you turn it off, we go back to scattering. Now, one of the downsides of that technology is that the polymer inside it acts in many ways as a resistor and you can't get the electric field through the device as efficiently as you might like. 
So these tend to be quite high electric field devices. So typically, yeah, okay, okay, yeah. <laughs> types of devices use quite high electric fields to drive the device on and off. But believe it or not, they are used in real applications. So they're used in conservatories, they're used toilet doors. So you know, here's an example of some toilet doors where they're using a little crystal. Now, I also said at the start that Liquid crystals were abundant in biological systems. And so here's an example. This is, this is DNA. So we all recognize the, helix, the double helix structure of DNA. And if it wasn't for the fact that the DNA exhibits a liquid crystal state, we wouldn't have been able to deduce the structure, or I say we, Rosalind Franklin wouldn't have been able to deduce the, uh, the DNA structure. Okay. And so in adding water to this, we get a nice uh, liquid crystalline organisation. And she was able to pull a, a nice thread of this and do the X ray analysis, and through the X ray analysis, be able to deduce the structure. And the lipids, these are abundant in cell membranes. <coughs> these lipid liquid crystals <coughs> behave as both thermotropic liquid crystals, so they show spectric A phases, but also as we add them into water, we get different curvature in the system. So we can go from lamella-like organisations through to cubic and then through to hexagonal structures. So this is effectively just swelling the size of the head group by adding water, which changes the curvature of the system. And phospholipids, once again, phospholipids are in the cell membranes. They form these myelinic tube-like structures, which are basically rolled up versions of the, of the uh, lamella structures. And these Myelinic tubes can then form other beautiful twisted structures like these road lines, the structures shown here. <coughs> and so this just shows you a cell membrane. The cell membranes are quite complex systems. But if you can control the liquid crystal organization at the membrane, the membrane is capable of holding lots of different structures within it. It's a dynamic system, it's constantly yet in motion. And so with drug delivery, you can insert different types of uh, structures within a membrane to allow transfer of gene deliveries or transfer of RNA, that, that type of thing, across the membrane. And there's certainly a lot of liquid crystal work going on in this area now. And another system that's quite important biologically is cholesterol. It's the one that the doctors are telling us to permanently lower in our diet. Now, cholesterol, the molecules here are chiral, so handy. And so when they form a nematic phase, the nematic phase has a helical structure through the chiral interactions of the molecules. So as you go from one molecule to the next, you get an angular interaction. Now, I'll pass this one around if you can just hold it by the tube. And so as you look around, you'll see that this one looks iridescent. And that iridescence comes from light scattering off the helix or reflecting off the helix. And it's this type of technology that we use in a lot of thermal display applications, so liquid crystal thermometers, uh, thermal sensors. Believe it or not, cosmetics. So here we've got an example of some lip glosses that are purely cholesterol based. With nice iridescent red colours due to the, uh, the liquid crystal organisation in there. And so, if we just consider the helix, what happens with the helix as we change temperature? And so, as I've already said, light reflects off the helix, you get selective reflection of the helix structure. And essentially what happens is, at high temperature, when the molecules are very energetic, at high energy, you get this large in, uh, angular interaction between the molecules. So you use very few layers of all, very few uh, molecules to create this helical structure. And so the pitch of the structure is very short. So we selectively reflect the short wavelengths of light, so the blue <coughs> wavelengths of light. As we cool down, the molecules have less energy, 
that angular interaction decreases, and the pitch of the helix is made up through many different uh, uh, sort of layers of molecules. I say layers, there are no layers in a chiral pneumatic. It is a continuous system, but we can imagine these as little slices. And so, at low temperatures, it's just like extending the coil of the spring here. And we selectively reflect the red wavelengths of light. And so, once again, I'll pass these around. So, we've got different, different thermal sheets. So, different mixtures of these compounds will allow us to change the pitch at different temperatures. And so you encapsulate these in a the plastic when you've got black backgrounds with plastic. You selectively see the colours, and these are just the ones that I'm passing around. They're just like one piece of a thermometer that you'd stick in your fridge or your freezer, fish tank or whatever. And I'm going to show you that at the moment this is a liquid crystal in a spectral state, so it's not flowing very well. It is flowing. So if you can see, you can see that slow flow, but it's not very colourful, it just looks like good. <coughs> but if I heat this up, I'm going to induce a phase transition from my smectic state into my pyromagnetic or polysteric state. So now, hopefully, what you should be able to see, if I hold around, is all the beautiful colours. now to say that I'm, I'm pretty much out of time. So I'll just quickly go over a couple, couple of little tiny bits. So you now this type of application can also go, believe it or not, into fabrics. So this was a, a big failed exercise. They decided to put uh, chiral systems in fabrics just like I'm, I'm rather glamorously displaying at the front here. <laughs> and what happened was you get a colour change as a function of temperature. And as we all know, where you're warm is, is a place you don't want to show up on your outfit. <laughs> and so this was a big disaster in all the models, except for maybe one or two grey ones refused to wear it. You can have displays based on chiromatic systems. So this is the magic display, so these are the billboards. <laughs> or you've got uh, beetles, the, the chitin in beetles has a beautiful structure which is very similar to that of the chiromatic. So mainly scarab beetles have this type of organisation. Other types of beetles have optical gratings that give similar effects. It can be incorporated into paints on cars. So you view them from one angle, you see a nice green colour, and other angle you see blue, or you see pink and green. So it's like... Now I'll leave you to think about this one at the top. Okay. I believe this is a spoof. Uh, they, they claim this was a little crystal rival. But I'm sure the colours are going in the wrong direction. Unless, of course, they're heating up the whole urine and you're cooling it down. So where is this vessel? Sorry? This is a vessel, right? That is a, yes. So where is it? I have no idea. It's, uh, it's in Japan somewhere. I did want to try it. Yeah. <laughs> The challenge is to get your whole name in it. <laughs> <laughs> and so as I say, we've got the cosmetics, which I, I've already shown. And the final one is just to really give you an appreciation of the, the people involved in the, in the early development of liquid crystals in the UK. And so, in the middle here, this is the late George Gray. So, uh, 
a very important figure in, in the UK liquid crystals. Next to George is Frank Leslie, who uh, passed away a number of years ago, 10, 15 years ago? 13. 13. So he did uh, a lot of the, um, the theories of liquid crystals from the mathematics point of view. And next to him is Al Sope, who did uh, theory and defects of liquid crystals. This rather interesting uh, character next to him is Cyril Hilson. And Cyril was involved in getting the TFT, uh, the, the silicon backplane, into uh, liquid crystals, which really sort of went into all your main television applications. Next to him is Alan Ledbetter, who did a lot of the X-ray diffraction and saw all the structures of liquid crystals. In the background, we have Martin Schapp and Peter Rains, who were involved in some of the display applications. So Martin Schapp was the twisted pneumatic display. Peter Rains was the super twisted pneumatic display. Here we have Jeffrey Luckhurst, who did some of the simulations, certainly the early simulations. This was who was supposed to be talking today. So this is a very young uh, John Booby. And at the end, someone Tim is most familiar with is Harry. Harry Coles. So uh, he was involved in a lot of the early polymer of the crystal work. So at that point, I'm just about on time, I think. So thank you all for your attention.